because the name tend to polarize. The touch me in positive or negative, <laughs> whatever. I am from Regione Marche, so I'm not from Florence, and other important things to say here in Pisa. Okay. What I am, I am the Director of Technology Innovation University Research of IBM Italy. Huh? Therefore, I will provide a brief contest of what IBM Italy is doing in this space, and after Ivano will tell what we are doing with IBM Global in, into this area. We have created, by the way, a new unit we call RMB, Rhythm and Blues, or Research and Business. And the joke comes from the fact, and this is important for you here in Normale, this explains an important topics, that there is not uh, any more much time between the research and the business itself. The development cycle has shortened up a lot. Therefore, it happens more and more that research people get directly problems from the final clients and they commute into solution. Hmm? And that's, uh, that's an important point. Now, the organization, yes, we follow all the Italian clients, and we have this unit called the Research and Business. You, you know, for the young people in the room, do you know what was the first product of IBM 107 years ago? It was a salami slicer. <laughs> if you go, it's true. If you go in Almaden, close to, San Fran, close to San Francisco, in the cafeteria, you find one. Then we were producing salami slicer, electric one. Electric one, yes. After one year, we bought the CTR computing tabulating record and the Olerit tabulating, tabulating machine, and that's, that's the starting of IT. That's the new IT. We are the history of IT of the last century. But we started with salami slicer. Huh? And uh, why a company producing salami slicer after 107 years produce quantum computer? Actually, we started 30 years ago. It will, it will tell us <laughs> with Charlie Bennett and, uh, and other people in that space. But in any case, uh, why a company is now moving from salami slicer, sorry for joking, into what we are doing now? How can a company do it? It does this, investing $6 billion a year in research and development. $6 billion a year for our Italian friends here in the room is, uh, I was telling this also to the governor of the Bank of Italy, that was telling Italy is, yes, it's a problem of uh, innovation. Yes, of course, if you don't put money, it's very difficult to do. <laughs> Italy is investing 20, to zero, public and private. IBM is investing six. Hmm? All the IBMs. That's a problem for Italy, not for, for IBM. But it's not enough. It's not absolutely enough. It used to be, we used to have research in our own lab by ourselves. It's not true. Okay, of course, we cooperate, but we used to do ourselves. Not true anymore. We needed to do together with our uh, university, with the, with the best university of the world, like you are, with the, with the best systems. Because uh, we have the, this, uh, this motto in research, the world is our lab. Research, IBM Research is now working, uh, not only IBM Research, IBM is working in open innovation or network innovation mode. That's why it's so important for us to be here with you. That's why it's so important to connect our research lab uh, in um, all over the world. The closest one is Zurich and Haifa, the one in Israel, and we have your town, and we have Alman, and we have to our clients. But another important thing we have, and a dream we share with uh, our uh, head of research in Europe, it is Alessandro Curioni, by the way, is an Italian, he is from Normale di Pisa. That's good to know <laughs> for, for you that, that are here, is that we want to open a research lab in Italy. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's my dream. I used to say on my burial site, I want written, he opened research in Italy and he died. Hmm? Now, now, cross fingers, probably because I will be 90 years old, things like that. As a matter of fact, uh, at the moment we can, write, we can write the open research in Italy, dot. <laughs> because I'm not going to die, crossing at least not immediately. But we, in Bologna, we have received the first uh, money from IBM Corporation and the first money from the local government, and we started with 28 people there, and I want to put some more all over the country, because I don't believe uh, that's another design point. We don't believe in a place like Italy you can do a single center in a single big city simply because it's not coherent with the system with the system of the country. So we want to spread. Of course, we're connected, tightly connected, but we want to, to distribute. We are envisioning a distributed model. We have decided four areas to work on. Health and nutrition, that of course is clear. You, you may imagine why in Italy we qualify for that topic. My daughter, when we were living in Dubai, was asking me, Daddy, how do you say pasta and pizza in English? Uh, pasta and pizza, even this, <laughs> we are superpower. The second is a human assisted solution. The third is proactive cyber intelligence and security. The fourth is new energy. 
In the last three years, we have selected uh, clients all over the country, and with them we started to make activities. We have a client in the health space, we have client in the university space, we have um, oil companies, we have uh, cybersecurity, and we have decided, and here I'm coming to the point, on foundational technology, what we call foundational technology, we have decided some activities, for example, with Vodafone, we are doing 5G experimentation for the country in Milan. And uh, we developed the Initri, the crypto card uh, for all the world, all the, crypto, the, crypto, the cryptography card that are there. Quantum computing, we definitely want to invest. That's why we are here. That's why Ivano is here. We will tell you, he will tell you what is this about, but it's our mandate to invest there. We sent over people all over our lab and um, of the world because we need antennas. And to close, of course, we work with all the universities of the country. To close, even this is not enough. Even this is not enough. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, cooperating with the clients, what is our lab? The, so we have to cooperate with the research center of the clients. We have to cooperate with the research center of the country. We have to cooperate with the research center of the world. Hmm? And uh, this happened with the Italian Association of North America Foundation of Italian Scientists, the ISNAF, and I started three years ago as a joke. And after I started to work with them, and there are Nobel Prize there, and they put me in the board of directors, and they, I found it very useful for retrieving money to bring to the country with the alumni. We were joking, we will, we will tell later how we can do this. Uh, and after that, China is investing heavily in quantum, and you will see, and I moved into the Italian Association of Scientists in China. We have the embassy, and after we do Israel, we are doing now Africa, because there are good movement there for... Um, I, this was part, when I was in emerging market, this was part of my territory, and I believe there there is a lot to do. And that's we want to expand. What we are doing in this country in terms of research, we want to make all over the world. That's... I am so happy to be here with you in uh, Normale di Pisa. That's, by the way, is where is a point of excellence. You don't need, uh, you need any special flag for doing that. You are by design one point of excellence, and that's, that's why we want us to find a good way to cooperate with you. We believe that quantum computer is the area, and I leave the word to my friend Ivano Tavernelli, with an Italian last name, with an Italian origin, but uh, is from Lugano. That, for me, is north of Italy, isn't it? <laughs> Canton Ticino. Ticino is an Italian river, isn't it? <laughs> Which, uh, ah, yes, you have to change the presentation. Yeah, Lori. I am checkato. You say checkato in. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yes. <laughs> checkato. And Definitely. No, 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 no. Sì. Ah, ok. Ok. Super. So... Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can you hear me? It's okay. And now, also? I prefer to stand, it's okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah perfect. Thanks. Okay, so I will uh, talk about quantum computing and IBM, even though the topic is more general than what it seems, because uh, I'm talking essentially about quantum computing in general, and then uh, I will show to you uh, some applications that are uh, related uh, to the platform uh, that uh, we have developed at IBM, uh, and then you can also use uh, through the, the, the cloud, uh, so the quantum experience uh, machine. So, um, here is uh, the 
IBM research uh, in Zurich that was uh, introduced before. So it was established in uh, 56, and his main focus is on, um, I have to read there because <laughs> his focus in uh, science and technology, system uh, research, and uh, computer science. So he has uh, quite an attractive curriculum with two Nobel Prizes. And um, recently we also opened, uh, together with ETH, uh, a nanotech center that uh, is run, uh, again, in, in collaboration with in ETH, collaboration with ETH on, nanotechnologies. on nanotechnologies. And we have collaborations with many universities, including the university in Italy. And uh, this is, we, we also contribute uh, to uh, teaching, so to dissemination, especially in quantum information. We started uh, courses at uh, the University of Zurich and also at ETH, where we try to, um, to get a new researcher into the field. Good, so this is the campus. You see it on the right-hand side, close to the lake of Zurich. This is the outline of my talk. So I will briefly introduce uh, quantum computing. So, I mean, the level would be what I think is uh, medium. Uh, I will not enter too much in the details with the risk that sometimes I will probably oversimplify some concepts. But uh, this is, I mean, um, the thing to do when you have uh, such a broad audience in front of you. Then I will introduce the hardware and obviously focusing mainly on the hardware of IBM because it's the one that I know the best, not because the other one are not good. And uh, then I will um, move more into the theory, uh, explaining uh, the logic, the quantum logic, the gates, how a quantum computer operates. And uh, the last part of the talk will be about uh, applications, uh, and uh, my focus will be today on quantum chemistry because it's where we have, uh, let's say, the, the, the most interesting results at the moment. But if I have time, I will also show to you some, uh, some other applications. So why do we need quantum computing? Uh, I think everybody here is familiar to Moore's law and the fact that um, the CMOS has reached uh, the limit. And indeed, if you look in, the, in this picture, you see that there is a saturation of the performance of uh, the classical, uh, classical computers. And therefore, uh, we have to think, uh, as a society, but also as an industry, about what comes next. So what are the next strategies possible? And one of those uh, would be to use uh, 3D architecture, so move from 2D um, uh, devices to 3D with all the problems that comes uh, with uh, this type of fabrication like heat dissipation and so forth. The other option where also IBM is very active is on neuromorphic or cognitive uh, type of computing. And the last one, the most recent one, is uh, quantum computing which is the subject of, uh, of this talk. Quantum computing is a very broad uh, uh, concept. Indeed, uh, we, we talk about a quantum ecosystem, right? Because uh, you need uh, many components, ranging from, uh, obviously, uh, quantum computers, you will see in a few minutes, they operate at 20 millikelvin, so you need uh, a fridge that can cool down your device at 20 millikelvin. Then uh, you need also to design uh, uh, the, the qubits, uh, and uh, to do that, you need uh, simulators. So you need the uh, possibility to simulate uh, your quantum device. And to do that, uh, you need large computers. So in order to simulate 50 qubits, uh, you need uh, a very large HPC. And if you want to simulate, uh, say, 100 qubits, uh, there is no way you can do it on Earth. And uh, next, uh, you need also to connect, uh, eventually, in the future, these uh, quantum computers together. Um, already, the quantum experience is uh, available on the cloud. You need fabrication. That's also very important. You need uh, control software, because, again, the electronics has also to function at 20 millikelvin. So this is a challenge uh, for microelectronics. You need quantum algorithms, and this, I will convince you, that is a real challenge for the future. 
And the reason is because you cannot take uh, a classical uh, algorithm that you have developed or somebody else has developed to solve, uh, for instance, uh, electronic structure problems in this case. You cannot simply translate those into the language of uh, quantum device, but you have to start from scratch, right? And this is what we are trying to do now at IBM, but in other many research groups together. And you also do need simulations to do system characterization. So you have uh, these uh, new devices that are built. Uh, you need to be able to characterize them in order to be able to improve them. Uh, we will see uh, soon that uh, the quantum devices are not yet uh, perfect or like we would like to be them to be because, uh, for instance, we have decoherence times in the order of microseconds, and this limits the performance of these machines, uh, and therefore we have really to try to characterize them better in order to improve uh, fabrication and get uh, better performing devices. So these slides clarifies a bit the state of the art, right? Uh, on the left-hand side, you have uh, classical computers in the 40s, uh, 1940s, and you see that probably this machine has now the power of your uh, mobile phone, and it was that large and very difficult to operate. And what you have on the right-hand side is uh, a quantum computer in 2010. So this is the analogy. So we are really at the beginning. There is a long way to go, the same that uh, we experience with classical computers, that uh, uh, you see that the kind of evolution we had uh, in the last uh, decades. So a lot of work to do for the young generations. Why quantum computing? So we know that there are many problems that are hard to solve <coughs> using classical algorithm and classical hardware. One of the problems that probably is more popular is the factorization of large numbers that is used in cryptography. But there are many challenges also in algebra, to, to solve a very large system of a linear system of equations that can be used, for instance, um, uh, in finite element um, modeling, and also in the combinatorial optimization and in the simulations of quantum mechanics. Right? So quantum mechanics is still a challenge today because of the exponential scaling of the resources that you need in order to solve the Schrodinger equation for a system of n electrons, right? And this is important in chemistry, but not only, also in material science, drug design, and all that. I mean, there is really the need to have a better performing algorithm to solve the Schrodinger equation for material science. Good, so the aim of everybody is to get to the full tolerant universal quantum computing. So this is our goal, probably not in the next 10 years, but we are working hard in that direction, right? With uh, such a machine, you can essentially perform any calculations, hopefully with uh, a polynomial scaling, right? The problem is that in order to get there, you need uh, error corrections. And in order to get error corrections, you need uh, an overhead of uh, physical qubits. Because in a way, the way we see it now is that you need uh, roughly 1,000 physical qubits to get a single logical qubit that you can operate. So it's really something for the future and is our goal because this machine can solve essentially any problem you can think about. On the other extreme, what we have now, we have large quantum machines that function as annealer, right? In this case, you can treat a small class of problems for which you are looking at the minimum of a cost function that can be the Hamiltonian of your system, meaning that you are looking for the minimum in the energy, without getting trapped into local minima that are hard to overcome using classical algorithm, right? And this is, for instance, what D-Wave is doing. They have thousands of these qubits, and the machine is highly spe specialized to solve these kind of problems with many drawbacks, right? Because usually they show you a landscape like this one, so the ground state potential energy surface, but they don't show you the excited state's potential energy surface. And you know that uh, when you drive the system along uh, this uh, potential energy surface adiabatically, right, you are never slow enough uh, to guarantee that you don't excite the system into the excited state. So there are really very big limitations. Anyway, it's not a universal 
quantum computer can only solve a small class of systems. So IBM instead took another path that is probably more ambitious to start with very small devices. At the moment we have on the cloud system 5 and 16 qubits working. But this type of device are the first step to move to the right column. So moving towards the fault tolerant universal quantum computer. So they are the building blocks for the, uh, the future universal quantum computers. At the moment, uh, uh, we are working on uh, algorithms that can already prove some quantum advantage with approximate quantum computing. So with this type of uh, not yet fault tolerant uh, machines, we can still produce algorithms that can sh show quantum advantage and therefore can become useful in many applications uh, ranging from uh, material design, quantum chemistry, optimization, and machine learning techniques. So here is where, where we stand. Let's move now to the most technical part that um, introduces the logic and the gates in quantum computing. So I start really very basics, showing you single bit on the top and, uh, uh, sorry, on the left hand side that can take only the value zero and one, right? A, a qubit instead, as you know very well, can take any value between zero and one. And since we are dealing with uh, complex uh, amplitudes, uh, then uh, these superpositions are described by a vector in a, on a sphere that we call the block sphere. So with the two angles theta and phi, you can describe any linear combination of uh, the two fundamental bits, zero and one. So this is already, you see, the change in paradigm. Before you had zero and one, now you have an infinite number of values possible between the state zero and the state one. Now, a classical device, if you set it at zero and you measure, you measure zero. If you set it at one and you measure, you will get one. A quantum device, if you have the state in zero and you measure it, you get zero. If you have it in one, you measure it, it's one, right? And if you repeat the same simulation many times, you get exactly the same statistic. Nothing is special if you have a pure state, so an exact state zero or one. Now, instead, if you build a linear combination with equal weights of uh, zero and one, this is not normalized, but it doesn't matter, then uh, if you start measuring this state, then you see that you can have uh, zero or one, depending how this state will project back uh, to um, the direction where you operate the measurement uh, that uh, is um, um, the vertical uh, axis in the, on the block sphere. And if you collect the statistics, you recover that uh, the system is 50% uh, in, the, in the state zero and 50% in the state one. Okay, if you change now the orientation of your vector in the block sphere, you repeat the experiment, uh, you collect statistics, you get 64% uh, in zero and 36% uh, in one. So far, I think everything is, uh, is clear. And what is that? I mean, is quantum mechanics just statistical mechanics? So I can build a classical machine that can exactly reproduce this type of uh, information? The answer is obviously not. And the reason is that it was because I was asking the wrong question. I don't have to ask what is the probability that it is zero or the probability that it is in one. What I have to ask is what is the probability that I have at the same time zero and one? And this, the probability to be in this state, is one. I measure it uh, 100 times, I still get one, okay? So this is the big difference between statistics and quantum mechanics. Classically, in order to get this combination, you will have to sample the zero, 50% 50, uh, 50 you will have zero, 50% you will, you will have uh, one, and then again, statistically, you will have 50% of the two states. Quantum mechanically, with a single measurement, I can spot 100% this state. Okay, so in summary, so when we are treating uh, superpositions of states, this is the way we call zero plus one in quantum mechanics, then we are not measuring a statistical mixture of zero and ones, but we are measuring a quantum state that is called a superposition state. And uh, in the 
common language, uh, probably everybody here is familiar with the Schrodinger cat, that the Schrodinger cat is dead and alive at the same time. Right? What about Schrodinger? Uh, Schrodinger is dead. <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> but the cat lives <laughs> longer. <laughs> okay, another important um, ingredient of quantum computing in addition to the superposition principle, is a quantum entanglement. Right here is a bit more complicated concept. I try to really simplify to the minimum. You have in the picture there, you have, say, a singlet state in an atom, so two electrons with the spin that is pointing in opposite direction, up and down, alpha, beta, depending how you want to call it. And then when you bring them apart, you separate them, even they're very far from each other, then quantum mechanically, the two objects remain, in a way, in communication. So if I do a perturbation of the system on, uh, on, on the right-hand side, then this has an influence on the system on the, the right-hand side. And this is, again, something that is only valid quantum mechanically. So if you do a single measurement, uh, Classical and quantum theory predicts the same, but if you compute uh, correlation functions of this uh, experiment, uh, then uh, you will get what are called Bell's inequalities that will tell you that uh, what you observe cannot be replicated uh, with a classical theory, but is really a quantum phenomenon. Right? And this uh, philosophically has many implications. Uh, so there is um, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, for instance, uh, that is uh, very much related to this property. Very important is the non-locality of quantum mechanics. The fact that when you split these two particles, they still communicate even when they are very far apart is something that, uh, I mean, is classically impossible, right? If you, from Newton physics, we know that uh, interactions should be local. So, and this quantum mechanics is completely non-local. And there is no way to complement quantum mechanics with hidden variables to make it a classical theory. This was proven already by von Neumann and other people. But for us, what is more important is the last point that you have here, yeah. is that uh, thanks to the entanglement, uh, we can build a huge Hilbert space uh, starting from the fundamental block of a single qubit. Right? The space that n qubits can span is 2 to the n. Meaning that every time I add a single qubit, I double the power or the size of the Hilbert space, and so the power of the, of the quantum machine. Good. So this is a chart that uh, makes uh, this concept probably clearer. So if I have uh, a single qubit, then the amount of information that I can store in a single qubit, since it has two states only, then is 16 bytes. If I have uh, two qubits, then the theoretical number is four, right? Two to the two is the two to the n power law that uh, I mentioned in the previous slide. If you have eight qubits, then you have 256 states that corresponds to about two kilobytes. Now let's move uh, to 64. If you have uh, 64 qubits, then what you can store in your uh, quantum machine, ideally, is uh, the information that you have in the internet nowadays. You only need 64 qubits uh, for uh, storing all that amount of information that corresponds to 74 millions of gigabytes. And the time that uh, a classical computer we need uh, to operate with all this amount of information is equivalent to years uh, on a supercomputer. Now, if you move uh, to 200 and uh, 56 uh, qubits, then uh, the size of the Hilbert space corresponds to the number of atoms in the universe. And obviously, you will never be able, using uh, HPC, classical computer, to deal with such an amount of information. So, and we are only at 256 qubits, right? But these have to be good qubits, with all possible entanglements and without errors uh, and other things that I will show in a moment. But the power, theoretical, is there. And this is why many companies uh, decided to invest in these techniques and also many universities because uh, the potential of these type of machines is enormous. Now, this is about uh, 
the fundamentals of quantum mechanics that is needed in order to understand the logic uh, of a quantum computer. So I, I repeat, uh, is the superposition of states, the Schrodinger cat, plus entanglement that allow us to enlarge the Hilbert space in order to have uh, something where to store a large amount of information and then uh, try to use them in the most convenient way. So now I move uh, to uh, the fundamental uh, units, uh, uh, the gates, uh, that is a way to translate uh, this uh, concept in quantum mechanics on a real hardware in order that you can use it uh, to build uh, quantum algorithms. The first one are uh, the single qubits operations. So here we put the state zero on the north pole of the block sphere and uh, the state one on, on the south pole. And as I mentioned before, you can generate on a quantum computer any linear combination of these two states. To do that, you need two angles, the Eulerian angles, and uh, you have to guarantee that the total norm is one. And uh, here you have the representation of the state psi, that is 0 0.250, 0 plus a uh, complex number time one, meaning that 90% of the time will be measured in zero and the rest in one. So that's basic quantum mechanics, and now you have the gates that operates on this uh, qubit state. Now we can map the state uh, 0 into 0, 1, with uh, some coordinates, zero, uh, 1 and 0, and we map the state 1 with, uh, say, Cartesian coordinate 0 and 1, and at that point we can operate with matrices, right? And uh, the first uh, operation that I show here is the X gate that uh, moves uh, your uh, qubit state uh, from the north pole to the south pole and the matrix representation of this operation is a two by two matrix uh, and operates uh, on uh, your um, vector generating a new vector. So very simple maths, it's just linear algebra. You can have Z <laughs> gates that perform uh, the operation that you see in the second column and you can have Hadamard. Hadamard is one of the most important gates because it produces what we saw before, is a superposition of two states. You see that the first operations from 0, 1 to 0, from 1, 1 to 1, or there was a swap from 0 to 1, 1 to 0, but it was not creating a superposition. The Hadamard gate instead produces a superposition of the two states. So you end up one over square root of two of the sum or a subtraction of the two states. We build a Schrodinger cat using the Hadamard gate on a single qubit. It's really not bad. You can do more, and this is all what you need in order to write your quantum algorithm. You need also two qubits uh, operation, and this is in order to entangle the systems together. Uh, the first one that I show here is called the swap gate. So it's essentially changing the two bits of information in the two um, uh, qubit state. So 0, 0, you invert it, you get 0, 0. 1, 0, you get 0, 1. And the second one that is very important because it's generated entanglement is, is the so-called C0 gate. And what it does is swaps the second bit depending on the status of the first. So 0, 0, the first is 0, doesn't do anything. 0, 1, the first is 0, doesn't do anything. 1, 0, the first is 1, then it operates on the second, inverting uh, from 0 to 1. 1, 1, again, the first is 1, that operates on the second one. And then if you want to generate what is called a Bell state, so a state that cannot be represented at a single product, but is really um, an entangled state, it's your first entangled state that you see here, you have to operate in this way, first with uh, the single qubit operation H, which is the Adamart that computes the superposition of 0 and 1, and then the C0 gate that does uh, the entanglement uh, uh, between the two qubits, and therefore you get, uh, no, this is not the way to point, I think, wow, and therefore you get uh, the Bell state there, right? So an entangled state uh, made of two qubits that cannot be represented in a classical way. It's purely quantum mechanics. Good. Now that we have an idea what are uh, the key elements, so we have superposition and entanglement. I try to explain you quantum mechanically. And then we move to the equivalent uh, in the circuits. So we have the Hadamard and the C0 gate. So these are the two operations that uh, can reproduce uh, the quantum mechanical properties that we need in order to operate with a quantum computer. 
But this is only theory. Now we need uh, the hardware. So we need to run this algorithm somewhere. And the hardware now is the topic of the next part. So you have uh, different possibilities here. How much time do I have? Uh, 26 minutes. Oh, OK. So we have different possibilities here to make a very long, uh, very long story short here. I will uh, only mention the last one. That is the one that I will describe. Um, I'm not really good in this, eh? because also I don't see. Yeah, uh, it would be the, this one, eh? the superconducting circuits, right? And uh, why they are so, say, powerful, and uh, why many um, institutes and many also companies uh, moved into this technology to produce quantum computers. The reason is that uh, this uh, superconducting qubits is a way to reproduce uh, the properties of an atom in a very large scale system. So this is uh, a millimeter uh, scale device and has exactly the same property of an hydrogen atom. Right? And therefore you see clearly the advantage here because it's easy to manipulate. Right? It's much easier to manipulate something that is large, bulky, than to manipulate single atoms that the day after they are not uh, what they were the day before, right? So this is a very robust type of device, easy to control, easy to fabricate, easy to replicate, and therefore is, uh, for the moment, uh, the, the, the technology that is most promising and that can be scaled up, uh, as uh, we saw, to thousands of uh, qubits in the case of D-Wave and to a couple of tens of qubits uh, for, uh, for IBM and other companies. So these are the fundamental building blocks of uh, the superconducting qubit. There is uh, the qubit itself that has uh, the potential energy surface that you see on the right hand side. So here. Right. This is potential energy um, curve of uh, the qubit. The circuit representation of the qubit, you have it uh, on the left. So is a circuit with a capacitor and an inductor. And the inductor is, in this case, is a, it's not a real inductor. It's a Josephson junction that produces the anharmonicity. And this anharmonicity of the potential is very important because we want to generate a qubit. So every time we excite this device, we want only to operate between 0 and 1. And probably here you remember from your basic quantum mechanics that if you have an harmonic oscillator, like in the picture below, so down there, wow, well, the delay is really, okay, it's better I don't point. So um, the picture below, then you see that you have an equal spacing of your energy levels. And so if you excite the system from zero to one, at the end you, you obtain uh, uh, the excitation of all the states. So you end up, uh, if you absorb two photons, then you get uh, to the second excited states because uh, you have exactly the same spacing between uh, the levels. And this you don't want in a qubit because in a qubit you want to operate between zero and one. And the way to break this symmetry is to make your potential anharmonic. And this is done by adding this element uh, that uh, replaces uh, the inductor and is called uh, the Josephson junction. And this is an element uh, that is a superconducting uh, uh, unit that operates only a very low temperature. And this is also the reason, one of the reasons, why we have to cool down the device to 20 millikel. The other ingredient of uh, component of your uh, quantum processor is uh, the microwave resonator that is used to read out uh, the state of your qubit. Uh, it functions as a bus, so in order to induce entanglement between different qubits and also as a noise filter. And this is purely harmonic. But there you don't store any information. So this is the circuit that uh, represents uh, the oscillator, the, the, the Hamiltonian, then you put the hats when you do the quantization of this and you get all your level equally spaced because it's a perfect harmonic oscillator. This is the other ingredient of a quantum computer. Already is just a repetition. So this is the capacitor with the Josephson junction. So this is the Hamiltonian. And you see immediately that there is a cosinus function here. It's a function of the flux in your qubit, meaning that your potential is not anymore harmonic, but it has this sinusoidal form. 
therefore uh, he has this shape and uh, you get uh, what you want uh, so a different energy spacing between 0, 1 and 2 and all the series of excited states the realization of this as I mentioned before these are macroscopic objects right? you see that this has a spectrum that resembles the one of the hydrogen atom but is made of many very bulky elements in, this, in the scale of uh, nano and millimeters and uh, when you have uh, a state that is moving from 0 and 1, you don't have a single electron that is excited, but you have a number of Avogadro, uh, of Cooper pairs, uh, that moves from uh, one island to the other island of your circuit. So it's really a macroscopic object. So you have Cooper pairs, but really an enormous amount of Cooper pairs that moves from one side to the other of uh, the Josephson junction. Good, so far for the hardware, this I skip uh, and uh, I move uh, to uh, uh, this picture here where I uh, try to uh, summarize uh, the different components of a quantum device. So you have uh, on the left hand side uh, the electronics, in the center you have uh, the dilution cryostat. So the, the, uh, the upper plane is uh, roughly 2 uh, Kelvin, and then as you move down in this uh, fridge, you can reach the temperature of 20 millikelvins is where uh, you have uh, sitting your uh, qubits. You have uh, um, the, the qubit here on uh, opla, there on the upper corner that sits exactly where uh, is the coolest part of your uh, device. Voila. And if you, if you use quantum experience, uh, is on such a machine that uh, you're performing your calculations. Good, this is uh, the short history of um, IBM uh, quantum processors, uh, starting from 2015 with uh, the four qubit device. In 16, we have the five, so we double the performance of the machine. Remember, every time you add a single qubit, you double the performance. Which you can already see this uh, chip as uh, the fundamental placket uh, for uh, a surface code type of architecture. You can link them all together and scale it up. We don't do that yet. Then we have the 16 uh, qubit in 2017 that is also available on Quantum Experience. I will show you later on. So you can use uh, for free this device and do your uh, calculations and your tests. And the 8 qubit uh, uh, device is also available but uh, I will not uh, discuss it here. So this is the concept of quantum computer. I mentioned before that there are uh, several types of quantum computers available. Not available, available there is only the IBM one, but uh, um, built in a way. And you have uh, some with many qubits and some with less qubits. Now you can tell me, but why IBM has only, say, 20 qubits while uh, D-Wave has uh, many, many more? And the reason is that the, the, the nature of these qubits are very different. Right? And here I report uh, a chart that measures the quantumness, so the quantum value of your uh, quantum machine, or the, quantum, uh, the quantumness of, uh, of your machine, as a function of uh, the number of qubits, so which is uh, this uh, axis here. I got, no, okay, the axis that goes... Uh, from something happened. Okay. Nice picture, yes, of course. <laughs> so this is not in my presentation. <laughs> ah, Salva Schermo. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So uh, on the x-axis you have the number of uh, qubits and uh, in the y-axis you have uh, the error, right? Large error towards small error. So in order to have a, a, a say, good performing quantum device, a quantum machine, you need to have both of these uh, properties. So you need to have many qubits because if you have only small qubits and then you can simulate it with uh, your mobile phone. But you also need uh, um, large fidelities on your operations. So you have to be able to reproduce uh, um, exactly the operations like the Admar gate that uh, I was mentioning before without error. So, and in order to get a large quantum volume, you have to move essentially along the diagonal. 
And this is the path that IBM took. So gradually increase slowly the number of qubits, trying to improve simultaneously the coherence and the fidelity of your uh, qubit operations so that uh, you, have, uh, you can maximize uh, the quantum volume. As I mentioned, there are other strategies. Other companies took another path. They first increase uh, the number of qubits, uh, but uh, without showing any quantum advantage because you see that you, if you move uh, from five uh, to 500 qubits uh, with um, small fidelities, uh, your quantum volume doesn't increase. And then later on, they claim they will move on the other direction and reach high quantum volume. IBM now sits uh, roughly in this position here. Good. Now, let's have a look to the software. So, as I mentioned already a couple of times, uh, we have uh, a, web, a platform on the web so that you can access uh, through the cloud, and it's called Quantum Experience. We have already many researchers uh, publishing using this tool, also using this tool uh, in, um, uh, for uh, teaching uh, quantum mechanics, hopefully in the future also quantum chemistry. The nice thing is that you sit on your, on your uh, desk, and uh, for instance, you can uh, in five minutes prove Bell's inequalities, something that uh, at my time as I was a student, it was impossible even to think about because you needed really a large lab in order to be able to perform these kind of operations. Now, really, you can prove the fundamentals of quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics, sorry, sitting uh, at home, uh, maybe watching TV at the same time proving Bell's inequality. I think is uh, is a great tool also for teaching, but now it becomes more and more an important tool also for research because we are getting to the point with the 20 and the future of 50 qubits where we can show quantum advantage with such an architecture. These are uh, the, the quantum processors uh, that are available on quantum experience. Uh, the, the, the original one that uh, was released in 2017, actually in 15, so here there is a mistake in the slide, is the five uh, qubit chip with uh, um, the, the connections that are shown in the, the part below. So not all qubits are connected with all qubits, but uh, with swaps gates you can also entangle any pair of qubits that you have in the chip. And uh, in the, the one on the right hand side is the 16 device, also accessible uh, on quantum experience when you can perform really interesting calculations also in quantum chemistry. Good, in order to uh, interact with these machines, uh, we prepared uh, a software platform uh, which is called WizKit that you can download also for free, it's an open source uh, code. And then using Python scripts, you can directly interact with the machine and uh, run uh, your calculations directly on the quantum device or uh, in a simulator that is also um, made available by IBM free of charge and with which you can uh, simulate up to 40 qubits, roughly. Okay, so far about uh, the basics. Now for the remaining uh, two hours or less, <laughs> I, I will... Uh, <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I will try to, to give you a flavor of what can be done in a real application right? in quantum chemistry. So it was uh, Feynman that uh, introduced this field in a way, saying that, uh, hello, I mean, um, nature at the fundamental level is described by quantum mechanics and you're trying to compute it with classical machines. Maybe we can do better if we move to a quantum computer and try to simulate quantum world with a quantum machine. And we picked this uh, challenge, uh, and uh, already in 2015, IBM uh, Yorktown produced this paper that got into the cover of Nature, where they showed the first calculations on very simple molecules, and try now in the next uh, nine minutes to get uh, there. So, why chemistry is a challenge? Uh, I, I'm sure that I don't have to explain it here. You start with the Schrodinger equation, and uh, you have... Uh, the problem that if you use a classical algorithm to solve this equation, you have an exponential scaling. I mentioned already at the very beginning. So you need an exponential amount of resources with the number of electrons in your system. Instead, the cost on a quantum computer to solve the Schrodinger equation for a system of n electrons only scales n to the power of 4. So it's a polynomial scale com scaling compared to an exponential scaling. So there is a potential benefit. 
please uh, skip it and uh, just mention to you that uh, obviously also in this school I mean there was a lot uh, going on in quantum chemistry and the simulation of computational quantum chemistry so people were not waiting for the quantum computer but uh, making approximations on the Schrodinger equation that were able to describe very large systems, right? Starting from Artifoc, going to all post artifoc methods. The only thing that I want to show you here is that if you want to improve accuracy, moving from the left to the right, then the cost of your algorithms in, in, increases dramatically. And therefore, for instance, at the level of CCSDT, coupled cluster, single level, and triples, you can only treat rather small systems because of the cost. And now what we want to do with a quantum computer is, is getting this type of accuracy, but with a much better scaling. Good. And uh, this is the state of the art, if you want. So we simulated uh, these molecules, but uh, later on I will show that we move also to larger systems. At the moment, we have only a few qubits. We can only do small systems. But uh, again, every time you add a qubit, you double the performance of your machine, meaning that uh, with a couple of hundreds of qubits, we will already be able, good qubits, we will be able to simulate systems that are already hard for uh, um, for a, a classical machine, for HPC, like this iron sulfur cluster that has very complicated magnetization properties. Good, let's see how we do that. So the way we solve, uh, uh, let me uh, see where I stand here, okay. So the algorithm that we use in order to solve uh, these problems is the following here, so we take uh, in this case, uh, our Schrodinger equation, we map it into the qubit, uh, and we have ways to do it uh, automatically using the Quizkit so uh, software that I mentioned you before. You transform uh, your fermo fermionic Hamiltonian into a qubit Hamiltonian that you can simulate on your quantum device. Uh, you don't use it like a black box. You don't see anything here. Just have to enter the coordinates of your system, the basis set of your system, and is translated automatically into a qubit Hamiltonian. And then uh, this qubit Hamiltonian, then we generate on the quantum circuit a state that depends on uh, the rotation on the block spheres that I showed you before, and also on, uh, on the different gates that I use for the entanglement. This is the psi um, theta that uh, is shown uh, in the blue box. And once you prepare in your circuit uh, this state, then you can measure all expectation values. So the quantum computer will produce all expectation values, and if you compute the expectation value of an Hamiltonian, you get the, en the energy of the system. So now, the quantum computer is able to produce you the energy of any state that you prepared and parameterized with the angle theta. This information is passed to a classical computer. Now this is the red box that minimizes the value of the energy in the space of uh, the theta parameters. It does change in theta, gives back the value of theta to the quantum computer that re-evaluates uh, the expectation value, so computes the energy for the new set of theta, gives it back to the classical machine that does another step in the optimization, and you continue until uh, you iterate until convergence. Uh, and therefore, this scheme is, in a way, a mix uh, is a mix architecture where you need a quantum computer that uh, performs the calculation of your matrix elements, the energy, and a classical computer that does the optimization at the parameter space. Now here I put an HPC, but you can do it with your laptop because uh, the systems are still very small. Okay, now here a few equations and then I stop, promise. So. I try now to show you quickly in three slides how you map a quantum chemistry problem into a circuit. First of, first of all, you compute the, for instance, Artifoc equation. So the Artifoc equation is a simplified Schrodinger equation for a many electron system that provides you the orbitals, and the orbitals you have them on the left hand side. Right? Once you have these orbitals uh, for a given molecule, in this case an atom, then you compute all possible integrals among those. So these are the HPQ and HPQRS that you have there. All these you do it classically because you can do even a protein at this level of theory. So you compute all the orbitals that you need and all the integrals among these orbitals. You do it classically. 
And now you use these parameters to parameterize, also to, to compute the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is given below, is uh, in second quantization form, but the only thing that you have to worry here is that uh, this uh, Hamiltonian is parameterized uh, uh, as a function of HPQ and HPQRS that I computed before, right? So by doing this very simple r calculation, I have all the ingredients to build the Hamiltonian. And now the, the, what we need to do is to compute uh, the wave function. And this is the hard part. A classical computer cannot compute this wave function because it's an exponentially large problem, so it's a hard problem, and uh, it's very uh, time consuming to get it uh, with a classical algorithm. And now we see how it works in a quantum computer. Now you take uh, all uh, your orbitals uh, that uh, you generated before and you put them on a quantum register, right? So you say that the first orbital is occupied, you put one. The second orbital is occupied, you put one. The third is occupied, the fourth is occupied, and then the other ones are not occupied, you put zeros. Right? You have all your qubits, and you say, this you represent the 1s, you represent the 2s, and the uh, 2px and 2py, and all the others are zero. And then you give an amplitude to this state, you call it theta1, this amplitude. Then you add a second amplitude uh, that now you see that uh, I have excited uh, the fourth electron into the fifth electron. And in this way, I can compute uh, the linear combination of an exponentially large space, actually combinatoric large space, and parameterized by my theta parameters. So very simple is uh, occupation. If an electron, is, uh, uh, an orbital is occupied, uh, I put one. If it's not occupied, I put zero, and I do all possible occupations, keeping the number of electrons constant. Then uh, this is my trial wave function, and you see it's parameterized by the angle theta, as I promised before. Then you take this wave function and you pass it through a circuit that I will not describe, and on the other side, it will give you the value of the energy for this. Uh, trial state parameterized by theta. And so you get energy as a function of theta that you optimize on a classical PC, giving back uh, the values of the theta parameters that you place again in front of your quantum register and you generate a new state parameterized on the same theta parameters and you repeat this operation until convergence. At the end you have the minimum energy of your system. This is the way you encode a wave function in a quantum computer and the way you can uh, benefit uh, of uh, having a quantum computer in quantum chemistry because you can solve uh, this exponentially hard problem in a polynomial time. Good. Uh, two minutes to show the example, the simple example for hydrogen. You have a theta function, uh, the, the, the electronic wave function of uh, the hydrogen molecule, so H2 parameterizing the angle theta, the corresponding Hamiltonian in the uh, spin operator, so after the transformation to the qubit space, the expectation value and the energy. Here is what you get if you use this uh, algorithm. So depending on the circuit uh, that uh, uh, you have implemented, uh, I don't discuss the details, uh, just look at the two curves that uh, converges below minus one uh, R3. You see that uh, by doing this iteration, you get uh, down to the red uh, line, dashed line, that is uh, the exact value for the energy of the hydrogen molecule at a distance t. So showing that uh, this quantum algorithm uh, with, uh, say, something like 50 iterations in the process that I mentioned before, it can, so this uh, process here, right? Voila. So this, uh, you, whoops. You iterate below between the quantum and the classical uh, uh, processor until, and you do this uh, as many times needed to get down to the exact value. And if you repeat this operation for different distances, uh, you reproduce the dissociation curve uh, that you have in the inside. And this has a perfect match with uh, the experiments, uh, with the exact results. Here is another example. For water molecule, I promise you that we can already scale a bit larger systems. Starting curve is uh, the red curve in the energy profile for the dissociation of a proton in water. Artifoc is the starting state, the red line, and then performing this type of uh, calculations, we get uh, close to the black line, which is the exact solution. So we can really reproduce couple cluster results now 
in a quantum computer. And very last is uh, the example on the right that is uh, inter of interest for the people familiar with density functional theory. So this is a chemical reaction, is the inversion of ammonia going through a structure that is planar and this is the top of the barrier that uh, you have on the right hand side. If you do this calculation in a quantum computer, you get the green line that is essentially on top of the black line, which is the exact result. If you use a density functional theory with a PBE zero functional, which is a very accurate functional, actually it's an hybrid functional, you get the blue dotted line. So now you see that a quantum computer can already outperform density functional theory for a system like that. So there is really something here that we want to um, push forward in order to be able now to move uh, to larger systems and, uh, and show quantum advantage in quantum chemistry. And with this, uh, I think uh, I conclude uh, acknowledging uh, all the people that are behind this work. And I thank you very much for your attention. Sorry if I was uh, a bit late. Thank you. Um, I am a quantum chemist since uh, nearly 50 years. Uh, I just think that uh, <coughs> there are many parameters for parameter denial of qubit quantum calculations is the qubit angle theta, polar angle in spherical coordinates. Here, I would like to repeat the definition in the qubit space because it's it's quite difficult for me to understand that. Thank you. Right, so. It would be better for me. Okay, here you are. Ah, okay. Thanks. Um, so I go back to the initial one where uh, I was. Uh, okay. Very beginning, yeah. try to be fast. Because it's a bad parameter. I mean, I think that here is okay, right? Yeah. So, what is. Ah, uh, okay, let me see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The coefficient that you got, the amplitude of the 0, 1, etc. Yeah, yeah, you can have any states. Perfect. We do an entanglement. He thinks, I press. <laughs> Thanks. Now, now we, we have good teamwork in IBM, IBM, by the way. <laughs> like here. I, I would like, like to ask a question about uh, quantum, quantum simulators. simulators. Now, you explained very nicely that you have this, uh, let's say, synergy between your quantum computer and a classical computer that at some point takes over and does a classical simulation. Now, do you see any potential for a synergy between your quantum computer and maybe a dedicated quantum simulator that could do part of a, uh, of a quantum evolution, maybe specifically for one chosen problem, and then hand the answer back to the quantum computer? Yeah, I, I mean, in state, with the state-of-the-art architectures, uh, I think that this is uh, the only way to go for the moment. So try to... Uh, think about a quantum computer as an accelerator for a classical computer. I don't know if this answers your question, right? So that there is the exponential hard part of the problem that should be encoded uh, into the quantum device. And then uh, it's very hard to do algebra on a quantum computer with uh, the limited uh, resources that we have now. So resources means not only the number of qubits, but also the circuit depth, so the number of gates that you can put and therefore, this part, everything that has to do with arithmetics, is better to do it on a classical device. And so, for the, this intermediate period where we have only, I mean, very primitive still qubits, then I, this is the way I see it. So, the quantum device is mainly an accelerator for. In this, in quantum chemistry, it's very clear the difficult part is to compute the matrix elements in Hilbert space. And this, you do it entirely on a quantum device. And then the optimization of the parameters in the future, probably this will also be done by a quantum device because quantum computer is a good optimizer. 
But at the moment, uh, we don't have enough qubits to do also this part, to dedicate this part to the quantum computer, and therefore we do it uh, outside on uh, an HPC. That is for convenience. Actually, could I follow this up? Uh, because I, so this was very clear. Now, my question was more in the direction of, of a quantum simulator, like a dedicated quantum system for one specific problem that could maybe interface with the quantum computer and then maybe, you know, so are, are you doing any research in that direction? Exactly, that's what I mean. To, to really understand the future of uh, the quantum annealer, right? Because uh, still uh, the proofs that is a quantum machine uh, are a bit shaking, and uh, I, I don't see so much quantum advantage uh, with this type of, uh, of architecture. And therefore, we are not investing time on that until uh, this gets a bit clarified. Okay, thank you very much. Go. I have a question about your algorithm for solving the quantum chemistry problem. So, if I've understood correctly, you need at least as, as many qubits as there are orbitals, right? Or basis functions. So, for a large molecules, let's say you have a thousand basis functions, but and then you need a thousand qubits, but which is a lot. But in the previous slide, you wrote that with 256, you had as many you could encode yeah. as many particles in the sure. universe. So. It but seems it, I mean, it would be overkill to have a thousand qubits for just a medium, for just one molecule. So, is there a problem with the algorithm that you're not? I mean, is uh, we just started, right? So, and we design an algorithm that works and function in this way. First of all, we use second quantization. We could stay in first quantization and uh, discretize the space and map the Cartesian space into quantum computer. That's quantum Monte Carlo, for example. I mean, it would not be quantum algorithm. It would be a quantum algorithm. In principle, it should be possible to it's possible. use I mean, fewer. It's, uh, the, uh, I mean, the reason why we move in second quantization in uh, these early stages of these developments is because uh, it's easier with a limited number of uh, qubits to do uh, a calculation that is, I mean, that has some interest in quantum chemistry. I mean, even H2, if you want to simulate it in first quantization, you have to discretize the grid, the space. So you need uh, maybe hundreds of qubits, I mean, 100 qubits to, to describe the space of two electrons, right? So the entry point requires a much larger number of qubits in first quantization than in second quantization. This is why we move in second. But it's true, I mean, this is really the problem. IBM cannot do everything by themselves. So we need the help of academics to look for better algorithms. Your point is exactly that, right? So in the potential, I always talk about potential. Potentially, uh, in 256 qubits, you can store an enormous amount of, uh, of information. But this is not what happens, right? Because uh, if a Martian comes with a quantum computer and gives it to me and say, this is the perfect machine, fault tolerant, and whatever, I don't know how to, to use it. We have to work a lot in order to produce the algorithms that are able to profit from this potential of a quantum machine. And there is really a lot of work to do. I mean, we are just at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks, of course, for, for the presentation and uh, we're all impressed by the fact that this does exist. Once I say this, however, this is not what Feynman had in mind, of course, uh, because we have not seen a real fully quantum uh, calculation today. So th the question would be, um, I saw about 80,000 users uh, on, on your platform. Um, among these 80,000 people, I'm sure some face different problems, not quantum chemistry related, they were treated in a fully quantum algorithm. So at what stage are we on this front, uh, and in which fields do we see something significant happening, incredible? I had some slides on that, but... Um, so there is... Uh, one part of the group is working on optimization problems using digital architecture, right? So, uh, for instance, in finance, we are preparing a paper on that. And um, for the solution of um, system of linear equations, so finite elements, sorry, this doesn't, it's not where I want it to go. And we have also now a couple of projects in, in these topics here, like uh, 
combinatoric search in, um, in uh, the chemical space. You know that um, the number of uh, structures that you can generate is enormous. Uh, here I have an example. So uh, on these uh, steroid-like uh, molecules, uh, we have many entry points that uh, we have a library of ligands that can uh, match with these uh, points. This is a combinatoric problem again, very hard to solve uh, with uh, a classical computer. On a quantum computer, we can load uh, a superposition of all these combinations and then optimize a cost functions that can be the interaction of this new molecule with uh, an enzyme pocket and trying to minimize all these structures simultaneously and find uh, the best match uh, uh, of ligands and uh, insertion points. And uh, the second one is uh, the very well-known uh, problem of uh, protein folding on polymer folding. Also, this, uh, this problem we know very well that classically you can probably fold uh, ab initio using classical force fields. Uh, you can I mean, do it probably with 20 amino acids not much more, and uh, again here, potentially, you, you can have quantum benefits. Right? So now we have uh, a paper in uh, preparation on this, uh, where we start, like in the old times, uh, with a protein on a lattice, a 3D lattice, and we solve, uh, uh, we find a minimum of uh, the potential energy of, of this system in, in the lattice. And it works, you see, Definitely quantum advantage, but again, we have limited resources, so we can only show the potential of the method, but um, uh, we cannot go further than that at the moment. Yeah. But th th there are many areas uh, that uh, are of potential. Areas. I have a question about the number you showed in one of your slides, which, is, which I fully don't understand where it comes from. It's the uh, number of bits which are of, of normal information which is related to the number of quantum bits. I mean, when you say that the system of two bits is related to 16 or 32, I don't remember exactly, number of normal bits is just the dimension in normal bits of the uh, qualification yeah, I mean, of the angle. Mm -hmm. So where does that number come from? It's the same slide I that the, my the colleague... Size of the, 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 yeah, the, the, um, the number of bits and bytes that you can store in a given number of... Uh, of qubits, yeah. yeah. This, uh, exactly the formula that gives you these numbers, I, can, I cannot recall, but uh, this you find it uh, in, um, in the literature. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I was curious, has IBM sold in com quantum computers at the moment? <laughs> yes. Yes. Who's, who's we, 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 are, we are not selling a full quantum computer at the moment. We are selling access to the quantum computer with the number of qubits uh, superior to the one available on the quantum experience. Why we have uh, this? Because uh, some uh, clients, uh, like big banks, for example, are asking uh, to have uh, an access with, the, with, the couple of, with one qubit or two qubits more than the one generally available. And that's, and that's just, just a way also for us to test, uh, to test the feasibility of the market of this stuff. But of course, to be, to be serious, my, my boss keep asking me, quantum and Vendi, how much do you use? <laughs> not much. We are not making money <laughs> out of it, realistically. This is still research, and, and this is uh, what IBM is doing in the research space. Basically, it's, it's, not, it's not a commercial thing at this stage, of course. In some years from now, we will move, we hope, <laughs> to move into commercial because, because we are a commercial company, but uh, by investing six billion in research, so we will keep having a strong research. But this is a research effort at this stage. We have this, um, on a commercial standpoint, that's what we have at the moment, yes. But we don't sell hardware equipment uh, at this point of time. We don't sell a quantum computer at home, yeah. Okay, we have here one last question, yes, and then there will be refreshments have, at the other end of the, of the floor. After I have a question for the room, after the last question. For yeah, uh, you focus on energy, but, you know, a large community of quantum chemistry now is instead uh, working on uh, molecular properties, so systems uh, evolu evolving under the effects of external fields. How far are you from that, and is there any interest uh, towards yeah. this direction? Question? Indeed, uh, um, 
I take the opportunity to say that at the end of this month, uh, IBM will release uh, the first open source version of the uh, QuizKit code, or uh, QCAM library, where uh, you can run simulations uh, on quantum chemistry also. Uh, you can compute energy, but also properties. So we have already dipole, density, and excited states that are in it. Okay? So obviously it's not general for, I mean, you can, doesn't yet apply to very large systems, but uh, we are moving in that direction. Obviously, the aim is to do uh, design and things like that. So we, we also have um, a project on um, alchemical potential, so to change uh, the structures in order to fit to a given external potential and try to optimize uh, both uh, the electronic structure and the nature of the nuclei in the same way. So, and this again, exploiting the fact that uh, we can fit an exponential amount of information in, in our qubits. So we can do both optimizations simultaneously. No, no, but we are definitely working in that direction. Energy was the starting point, obviously, because you, you, you have to get the, the wave function, right? So the energy is fundamental because it allows you to get the wave function. But once you have the wave function, you can, you know, I mean, even the density will be enough, you can access all the properties of the system. So now in the QCAM library, we offer at the moment for the public only the energy and the dipole and some other properties that are forgotten. Then for the clients, so this is the model, right? There will be two versions, a basic version that is open to the public. And then for the people that are ready to pay a bit, I don't know much. <laughs> Uh, uh, there are other properties available, for instance, the couple cluster uh, approach uh, that we developed. This is um, separate, uh, and the excited state module is also separate. But uh, as soon as we will progress, this part will become available for the public, uh, and uh, the rest will remain access for the client. So this is the model that we have in mind. Just one comment. The energy that you're computing is protected because it's a solution of a variational problem. So the energy will be more precise than the wave function. When you, when you apply the wave function to other observables, you are not necessarily as protected as with the energy. That's uh... Okay, so let's uh, thank a, our guests. I, I, have, I have a question for the room, and I have to make a, hey? a very small okay. comment. Do, do we have an engineer in the room? Okay. I understand because we have more than 5% women. <laughs> No, no. I am an electronic engineer. We, in electronic engineering, we don't study quantum physics. We don't study numeri primi, the prime numbers, because we have been created for certainties. This is a neopositivist, a neopositive school, yeah. No, but, uh, and usually in IBM, the, I am the technical director, I have all the technical people with me. The majority of the people we have in house are engineers. That is good. It was good in a period of time. What we are doing now, this is just a, a small information for you, we are moving our new hiring in the space of uh, physicists and math, mathematician and, and chemistry, that's the point, and uh, we are opening also new spaces in research in Italy, that's what I am working on, so if some of you is interested, uh, that's a good discussion topic during the buffet. That this was what I wanted to open. Okay. See, being you the only engineer, don't worry. We are two. We can talk together. And by the way, we don't have cats because we don't know if they are alive or uh, alive or dead. We prefer dogs, and that's okay. But <laughs> that's good. Let's thank our speakers, and then uh, we move. To the